This is Ari Koretsky and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. And we are back with our third and final installment in the Israel Podcast Tour mini-series featuring pioneers in the area of special needs and inclusion. For those listening to this in real time on the release week, sorry it's a couple days late, this is what I refer to as my tax season in my campus job working with students at University of Maryland with the beginning of the semester, so I've been a little bit delayed in releasing. And next week, with Rosh Hashanah coming up, we'll probably be off and then uh, jump back with the next Israel podcast. Very excited about the upcoming episodes, continuing to feature amazing areas of social action and kindness in Israel, although not particularly in the area of special needs anymore, moving in a different direction as we proceed along this slow release journey of the incredible interviews I was privileged to conduct during my time in the Holy Land. But now, without further ado, founder of Bait Izzy Shapiro, Naomi Stuchiner. We are here with Naomi Stuchiner in the beautiful city of Renana outside of Tel Aviv at the headquarters of Bait Izzy Shapiro which is an amazing organization uh, dealing with children with disabilities and many other different things, which we're going to hear all about. How are you, Naomi? I'm great, thank you. I'm pleased to meet you and pleased to be here with you. Wonderful. Thank you for for joining us and uh, for welcoming me to this beautiful place. Very picturesque town and uh, beautiful building. And uh, I really don't know much about your story or the the story of this organization. I, I, I told you and I'll tell the listeners I learned about Izzy Shapiro, Bait Izzy Shapiro, because about two years ago, I was at APAC at the major annual conference, and they did a, you know, they do spotlights at different times on different interesting and inspiring things that are going on in Israel, and this place, Bait Izzy Shapiro, was highlighted and it's honored there, and I saw a video about it, and I kind of filed it away in the back of my mind, and when I was doing this uh, this live podcast tour here in Israel. It was one of the uh, one of the places I really wanted to visit. So that's really the extent of what I know about wow. the organization. <laughs> and certainly I know even less about your own personal story. So take it from the top. I hear maybe a South African accent, if I'm, if I'm accurate. Tell us a little bit about your own history. Yeah, once a South African, always a South African. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've, I, I've been in Israel for the last uh, 48 years. Goodness. Um, and still you have that accent. And I still have that accent. So you can, t- you can with, take the girl out of the bush, but you can't take the bush from the girl. What can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> what can I tell you? And when I speak Hebrew, it gets, it gets even more, more uh, uh, serious. You pick, pick it up in, in one second. Wow. Um, I, I, I came on Aliyah, married to an Israeli. He came to South Africa uh, on, a, uh, on a, he said he came on a safari and I'm the Ville de Chaya that he took back <laughs> with him. But uh, that pretty much what happened, we met in South Africa. You have to be married almost 50 years to say such a thing. Really, really. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid he's been saying it for longer than that. So, <laughs> um, I, I guess uh, from, from experience over the years, he polishes that up very well. Um, I came on Aliyah as a young social worker. Uh, with, uh, without my family, my husband's family was here, and um, I guess I never, in my wildest dreams, imagined that I would ever um, become so much part of Israeli society and um, maybe have a role in, in, in making a better world yeah. for so many people. And, and thank God I've, I have the real, real schut, the real honor to be part of a very, very an exciting time in Israel, but also an exciting uh, movement towards equal opportunities for people with disabilities within, within Israel society. Beautiful. And um, so uh, where it started. <laughs> well, before we get there, I want to get back a little okay. bit more, just in your in terms of your own childhood. Did you grow up with a, with a very active uh, Jewish uh, background? I know South Africa tends to be more traditional than you know, maybe less assimilated than some of the other diaspora communities. What was your background like? Yeah. 
Well, I'm the youngest of three children. I grew up in a very uh, Zionist and uh, Orthodox family. Johannesburg uh, or Johann Cape Town? Johannesburg, okay. very much Johannesburg. Okay. Uh, and um, with a lot of chesed in the family. My, my late father, Izzy Shapiro, mm. I'm very proud to be the daughter of both Izzy and Lucy Shapiro, because my mother was a real um, personality in her own right. And uh, I grew up uh, in, in Johannesburg within a, a, a very traditional, caring, uh, involved community uh, family. So I, I finished a Jewish day school in Johannesburg and a King David school and I went on to study social work at Wits University um, and uh, when I was already in my third year of social work I met my husband. He actually came to South Africa, as he said, on a safari. Right, safari. He was just touring. <laughs> was he like after the army or? No, no, no. He was already, he was working. He was a travel agent at the time. And it was at the time that Olympic Airways had an inaugural flight to South Africa and a whole lot of travel agents came to South Africa. Ah, and, to check and, it out. And, and to check it out. And my sister happened to be on a year in Israel and she was working for Dizin House, which is a very well-known travel agency in Israel. And um, they came to give me a message from my sister. And that was the time that I met my husband. And um, I, I was, happened to be coming to Israel a few weeks later. Everything was very much beshert, you know. Wow. This happened to be and that happened to be. And we met up and, uh, we, well, I was still a student and I, I wanted to finish my degree. Sure. And we corresponded and travelled and saw each other over the, the next two years almost. Wow. And long uh, distance relationship. Absolutely. Without email or FaceTime or art? <laughs> no. Amazing. I can't even imagine how that happened. I remember being at work and getting a phone call from our our um, maid, it used to be called a maid. Right, at home, the help in, help in South Africa. Yes. And she'd say, the, the post has arrived and there's a letter from Israel. And I would actually leave my office, get into my car and drive the 15 minutes to, to the house to pick up the letter and come back. And um, just a few years ago, I found this whole box of all these letters wow. that my husband and I had written to oh, each other. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Um, and I, you know, I thought I need to go through them because uh, maybe some of them will be interesting for the next generation. <laughs> Do you have seven cents in the belt? <laughs> have to work out which ones to it's say. Right. You take the black uh, redacting pen, you know. Yeah, I think so. Um, and that was my, my, it was very clear, um, clear to me and to my family that I would make Aliyah. But I was the youngest of three children. And even though my family was seeing that they would eventually make Aliyah, yeah. um, I kind of made it a point and said, okay, I'm on my way. Took the lead. Got, mar got married and came to live in Israel. And um, five years later, my brother came. A year after that, my sister oh. came, and a year after that, my parents came. That's wonderful. And thank God we had this beautiful aliyah of all our family. And um, and the truth is that my dad in South Africa had been very involved. Uh, he had set up a program in Johannesburg, an in what was then a residential facility. I mean, still is, but you know, it was an institution, which is different to the way we look at things right, today. Right, right. And um, he set up this institution in Johannesburg for people who had different kinds of disabilities because he had a friend who had a child with a disability and there were no services. And in those days, um, it was not. Uh, uh, it was not feasible. It was not accepted that parents would bring up their children at home, in the home within right. the within the family and within the community. So what would happen? And I, as a child, I remember growing up, and in the middle of the night there would be a phone call, and my dad would answer the phone, and there would be somebody to say a child has just been born. A lot of Down syndrome child children in those days, and my dad would go and pick up the child from the nursing home and bring the child straight to the institution. Wow. Now that's so hard to imagine that in today's I can't I can't even such imagine. Such an anachronism, yeah. So so but in fact I think having that knowledge was part of the impetus, the the striving for making it um, so clear that parents have not just the right but we have the responsibility to yeah. help them to bring up their children at home within yeah. their family, within their community and that we have to make sure that there are the right facilities for them to be able to do that. Right. And um, at the back of my mind, I mean, I never thought about it then as a child and certainly not when I was growing up, but when I, when I was a social work student and I studied community work, I had a different philosophy 
and I was kind of, I think I was rather outspoken. You were rocking the boat and a little bit. I was bit. really <laughs> rocking the boats in, in, in South Africa. So when I came on Aliyah, and I was a young social worker, sure. and I started working actually in Shkunata Tikva, and that was at the time of the Black Panthers, the Black Panther movement, which was really also simultaneous to the, 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 the development of Shas, you know, and... Uh, Shas and being the Sephardic, Sephardic religious party. That's yeah. right. And that was when um, people, uh, you know, in underprivileged, in the lower socioeconomic uh, neighborhood of, of Tel Aviv, were standing up for their rights. Yeah. That was the time when the late Ofra Chaza was the first time on the stage at the age of 14. She became a very, very famous, wonderful singer. And she was and, from one of these disadvantaged... And she was from Shkunat Tikva, and that was right. the beginning, and I was part of that process when she was, you know, she was wow. launching, uh, she was being launched. And Shkunat Tikva was kind of like a slum? It was a slum area. In the, in the area around in, Tel, Aviv. In Tel Aviv. South yeah. Tel Aviv? South Tel Aviv. Yeah. Um, and that's where I started my professional career in Israel. So nothing to do with special needs, Absolutely. really dealing with a more, no. just a disadvantaged economically Absolutely, but population. it did have something, it's funny how everything is connected, because at that time, Aura Namir, who was, um, became a member of Kleser, she was the secretary of the Na'amat, which was the Histadrut women's organization. Mm. And um, she, uh, we started off the first um, uh, summer camp for working mothers. Oh. And Oran Amir later became the head of, she became the Minister of Welfare, I think so, but she became, I think she was the Minister of Welfare, but she was also responsible later for what became another uh, turning point for Beatriz Shapiro. Um, when we started working on developing community services, when there was a long list of, um, she was the Director General of the Ministry of Welfare, she wasn't the, the Minister at the time. And then there was a long list of kids on a waiting list for out-of-home placements for institutions with disabilities because that's what parents were told. Yeah. You have a child, quickly register your child for an institution. Why do you think that was? Was it a function of embarrassment or was it that they just weren't equipped to deal with the child? I think that it was a combination of many things. Firstly, um, there was a lot of shame of having a child with a disability. Why? I mean, just from today's context, it's so hard to understand. Was it that the parent had done something wrong? I mean, why would anybody think, why would there be any reason for shame? Well, firstly, shame is a very interesting, you know, uh, uh, issue. Shame comes from, um, from attitudes in the community towards certain populations or certain issues. Uh, shame comes from an inner thing that I haven't succeeded. I'm, I'm not good enough. I brought into the world a child who is not perfect. There's a little bit of a Jewish, uh, Jewish philosophy, guilt there. Jewish guilt. You know, um, we want our children to be achievers. Right. And um, when you have a child, or when you had a child today, I really believe um, that there's been a major change. But when, when you have a child who is less than what your dream is, every parent wants a child to be Right. healthy successful, and, and successful scholarly and, and, and right, whatever et cetera, right. so when a child with a disability is born then there is a, a sense uh, of shame along maybe even a process of mourning you're mourning the loss of the healthy child and all these issues are very very much part of the way we see the child and the family and the way that the family uh, is able to relate to a child with, with, with special needs and that ability to relate well has got to do with the way the community relates. So when we created Betty's Shapiro, I had all this history of, right. of activities and understanding and insights and understanding that I had small children, I wanted the best for my children, and I wanted the right facilities, but I had a choice. And parents with disabilities then didn't have a choice. And the only choice that they were given when we started was register your child for an institution because when the time comes, he needs to be on that list. And that for me was the most terrible thing. That right. I, and that's when Oren Amir was the Director General of the Ministry of Welfare. And I said, this can't be. We have to find an alternative. And that's how Bait Easy became pioneers in the field of community services for people with disabilities. Now in those days, would parents have zero contact with that child in an institution? Or no. would they go visit the child? What well, was that relationship like? Well, depending on where they 
put the child. Okay. When if the if the child or an older child might have been an adolescent or even an adult, but let's say the pro they, oh, they're all children, not because of their disability, right. but because we gave birth to children. Right. And um, I think that would be very dependent on a number of things. Some parents uh, have the luck of their child being institutionalised in a facility close to where they lived, so they had accessibility. Some parents had um, uh, bad luck because they never said to the parents, well, we'll look for somewhere close by. They would have on the north, in the north, so wherever the there south, was an opening. Wherever there was an opening. And then there were those parents who said, we can't see this, this is an embarrassment, this is a shame. And, and some of those didn't have contact. But um, I would say that a large, I, I, I believe, I really believe that every parent wants to be able to nurture their own child yeah. and wants to be sure that is a, a, a natural, the natural way of parenting and that they want their child to be taken care of and they want the best for their child. And if for some reason parents have to, at some stage of the child's development, place the child in an out of home, I like to call it an out of home place yeah. because it could be many options and they're good options today, you know, in different senses. And there's a warmer sound than institution, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah, and uh, then, um, you know, then that should be a choice of the parents. Right. It shouldn't be something that there's no choice because they, they're at their wits end, there's nothing else that they could do. And maybe um, what, I, what I, I have to fast forward for one second. Sure. And my fast forward is to say, we started off 38 years ago with 16 children. Today, Bait Izzy impacts in direct therapeutic and education programs on over 8,000 children and adults a year. Wow. And in extensive other services, which have got to do with uh, community services and legislation and pro other programs, we impact in Israel and abroad on about half a million people a year. Unbelievable. Now, so Beit Izzy is uh, in Israel, you know, we, we, we can count about 30,000 people a year. We impact on many different sure. levels. So the direct care, the education, and the, the, the 16 children who were in, you know, children with severe uh, intellectual disabilities. That program for the children became one of the first programs for children with intellectual disabilities, uh, which was a therapeutic rehab program in the community. And then more and more programs happened. Bait Izzy became a kind of an, uh, uh, an engineer for change. Uh, um, because we had programs, we were giving them on the highest standards. Um, we Not only did we provide the service for the child, we provided for the families. We understood that the families are an integral part yeah. of any child's life, and, and, and especially for kids with disabilities. So the family can deal, can be empowered, and not only be empowered, because that's even patronizing today, I would say, if the families can be partnered in a way that they can feel that they are not alone, they've got the right services that they want for their children, then um, they can function better and the extended family functions better. And then the community becomes more amenable because we're dealing with parents who are no longer ashamed, yeah. the parents who can be advocates for their children. And we at Bed Easy over the years, we developed services, direct services for the child, for the family, the extended family, groups of brothers and sisters, for grandparents. Grandparents have a tough time when, a, when they, yeah, their child their has dreams their, of their, uh, yeah. continuing the generations in a particular way. And then that, that also, but also the sadness, you have a double sadness, one mm -hmm. for your own children and one for your grandchildren. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. so it's, it's compounded when you're a grandparent. You know, mm. we, want to, we, we care about our grandchildren in a different way to the way we care about our children because we want to be so protective of the next generation, you know. Right. And um, so we have those services. Then we decided that in order to be able to provide good services, we need to have good staff. And not everybody wanted to get into the field of uh, intellectual disabilities when we started. So we started working with the, ac uh, the academia, the, the universities, to train professionals in the field of, uh, at, the, at the time it was in the field of intellectual disabilities. Then it, it expanded and we, we formed coalitions with the universities and allegiances with the universities. We decided that if we want to serve professionals and we want to provide cutting edge services for the children, then we have to have a, a research, research which would assess, you know, are the cutting edge programs that we're doing, are they being effective? Um, do, you know, uh, is this the best way to do it? And slowly we were able to 
provide model services to test them out. And export them. And export them. And the export model that made easy has a, is a very, very strong model. Wow. The other part of it, the last part of it, is the community. We say, we say to parents, we want you to look after your children, to take care like every other parent, uh, your children within the community. Therefore, we have to have a community that is accepting, that is knowledgeable, that is not afraid, and that will include children with disabilities. So we became part of an education program from children in nursery schools. We developed uh, programs for kids in junior high. We developed programs of inclusion. Our beautiful facility, and you're seeing one part of it, is a really a world-class facility, but it has a unique program of having direct therapeutic services. You're, there, there's a school, the nursery schools, there's a school, there's the first, the first hydrotherapy center for all kinds of disabilities. We have an international training center, hydrotherapy center. We have dental treatment, dental clinic within this facility. We have a sports, a state-of-the-art sports facility. So what we're saying is that the child, any child, has a need during his growing years to have uh, good educational services and good um, uh, support services and social activities and if necessary therapeutic services. Uh, parents who feel that it's okay, that they are not on their own, so we have support services for families and we have a range of services on different levels so that the whole issue, and my dad had a vision, my dad had a vision of change and of equal um, facilities and equal opportunities for all children. And that's the way that you provide it, that you work on different levels. Wow. So we fast forward it. Let's Absolutely. rewind we'll again. Okay. Uh, how, did, how did the whole thing, you know, how was it all born? You're, I mean, you're here in Israel and eventually your whole family was here. Yeah. Where did everyone move to? Uh, to Ranana. Everyone was in Ranana from the I, beginning? No, I was in Tel Aviv. Okay. My husband and I were in Tel Aviv. And his and family was from Tel Aviv as well? His family were from Tel Aviv, yeah. And uh, we lived in Tel Aviv for the first five years. And then my parents came on Aliyah and we bought in Ranana and we all moved to Ranana. So we've been in Ranana for a long, long time. And so your whole family ended up in Ranana? Our whole family ran Siblings up and Ranana. everything. My brother then moved to Caesarea, but the whole family ended up at the beginning in Ranana. Okay, it started my out that way. My sister still lives in Ranana. And yeah. for the first few years, you, like you said, you were working as just a regular social worker with disadvantaged youth in the south of Tel Aviv. How did you then move into this field of special education and, and children with disabilities? And in particular, you've mentioned many times your father, after whom this facility is named. What was his role in all of this? Was he the one who, who launched this project or was it you in his name or in his memory? What was kind of the whole genesis of that uh, experience? Well, you, you just said it, he died. He died before he realized his dream. He realized his dream for Aliyah, for coming to Israel and having his children in Israel. And he relished every moment. Mm. He loved, loved, loved being in Israel. He forgave things that nobody else would forgive. He used to walk around proud to be living in Ranana and, and he was wonderful. He just loved it. And then my mom and my dad went on a trip overseas and they were going to, he already had an idea about setting up a program in Israel. And had he done this professionally no, no, back in South he, Africa? No, no, he was a volunteer. What, was, so what was his profession, what was his work? By profession he was a lawyer, okay. but he was in business. He, he left the law, he, he, he stopped practicing law, and he went into business. And after I made Aliyah and my brother and my sister, they made, my parents made Aliyah. Sold his business? He sold, he, he had partners, he sold out his part, and he came on Aliyah. And what was he, what, was he retired when he, he got was, here? He was retired. Retired? He, was, he, he came on Aliyah at the age of 62. Ah. He went on a trip at the age of 65 to, the, to America. He was in New York for two weeks, he got onto a plane, and in, on the plane from New York to LA, he had a heart attack and he died. Aye, aye. And he was 65 years old. He was aye. in the prime of his life. He was so, so uh, uh, excited about being able to do something. He started to plan a, a facility in Israel. But the facility that he planned was really a similar facility to what he had done in, in South More Africa. More of an institution. He wanted to help families who wanted to make Aliyah with children with disabilities ah. to be able to have a place to come to in Israel. And was there any institutions at that time there in were, Israel? Israel was full of residential facilities. That's the whole the, the, the whole philosophy in Israel right. was out of home placement. But it sounds like he was also planning one like he, that. He had he wanted to help to, to, to make you know to help families make Aliyah 
I, he and I didn't agree on this, right. you know, but this was, uh, this was his dream. And when he passed away and we, the family got together, I remember we all went for a weekend before Yamit was given away. And we sat together as a family and we said, what do we do in his memory? Now, the truth is that before, um, before that, we, when we were sitting Shiva, my cousins, the Trumps from Florida, they um, came to my, my, my father's late sister, my late father's late sister was Celia Trump, and they came to the, to the Shiva, and uh, Jewel said, your dad wanted to do a, have a facility in Israel. Let's talk about it. And uh, I, you know, this, was, this whole thing was such a terrible shock. Like, so sudden, yeah, yes, uh, you he, weren't he, ready he, for that. He was here 10 minutes ago, and now he's no longer we're going to talk about how do we um, memorialize, him. memorialize him. And it, it, was, it was very hard, but I was already working in, in the field in Israel. I get rather excited about all this, but I missed a, a beat. After Shwanat Atikva, I had the third and fourth, I had twin boys of my children. Uh. And I left Tel Aviv University and I set up uh, the first community mental health program with the late Professor Sam Davidson of Shalvata Hospital. And I was, I was already creating new services in Israel. And the first of many community mental health started in Ranana and I was the person who worked together with Professor Davidson. So when my dad died, I was in that job. I worked for Kupat Cholim. And I, and I worked for, for, for Shavata Hospital, Mental, Mental Health Institute, and I, and I left Kupat Kolim, and when the family decided that that's what we wanted to do, after the first, the Shloshim of my father, the first month, we went to visit my original connections at the Ministry of Welfare and said, what are the needs? Because I'm a social worker, you have to ask, what are the needs? You create services because there are needs to create them. And they said that there were a group of kids with severe intellectual disabilities with also severe behavioral problems. And those children needed to, they, we needed a program. So it was our first year we decided. And they okay, weren't being institutionalized, they, those they, children. They wanted to prevent institutionalization. The government understood then that there had to be an alternative to There was already a sense and awareness that okay. something needed to change. Absolutely. But the issue about what was the way to do it was the question. The program that they suggested was a, pro a program of behavioral modification. Mm. Now, I'm a social worker. I don't believe in behavioral modification as the way to, you know, to, 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 to help a child with disabilities. But I only discovered that a year later, <laughs> after we'd done it for a after year, trying. and and we said, okay, you know, the year was up, and you know, and and, and we understood uh, that uh, this was not working, and that we were missing the most important component. We were focusing on the child's behaviour instead of the child within the family and within the community, and that was the turning point. We started from the beginning, and we started developing this therapeutic program for the child and for the family. And um, start and then so with, the with, with the systems, with the, with the systems, and with processes where we understood that the child cannot be, he is not in a vacuum. This is we, we don't want to make the first alternative for a family out of home placement. We want the first alternatively. How do we support the family's natural desire to be able to give the child everything he needs while he's at home and and within the family realm. And that's what we did, and that's how we created. And by creating that first program, we created a new way of looking at kids with severe problems within the community. And we knew that it wasn't just the child, it was the family. And we, needed, we knew that we had to provide, as I said, we had to provide the whole range of services mm -hmm. for the, the, the focus on the child and the focus on the community and changing attitudes and training yeah. as a whole, uh, a whole structure. And that's how the, the, that's how the change started in Israel, and Beit Izzy was um, very very instrumental in leading that change, and those were the, the early days. Um, alongside with that, as a nonprofit, we had to find funding. Right, how did you? Well, you had. It sounds like this yeah. cousin of yours <laughs> was very <laughs> instrumental. I mean, I saw their name on the building. I think we're in the Trump wing, maybe yes, right now. So. Trump wing. Nothing to do with the current president no, of the United States. These these are the real Trumps. Yes. <laughs> nothing to do. Nothing to do with the. the, the these for are better or worse. The yeah. most uh, wonderful, most uh, philanthropo ph philanthropic, Zionist, wonderful, wonderful family, uh, who I'm lucky to have as my family. Yes. 
and they accompanied us and have accompanied us on this journey right from the very beginning. Wow. And they really helped us to set up the funding infrastructure. At the beginning, it cost $1,000 a month. For 16 children, it cost $16,000 a month. And we had some support from uh, a foundation um, that the government uh, helped us with. Uh, and then the rest we had to start fundraising. And did the so Trump family gave most of that money? And the Trump family gave 50% of the money and we had to find matching. And over the years and over the months and over the years, I realized that if we want to be able to provide the, the services on the standard that we are, um, you know, we are determined to provide, then we have to start getting into the fundraising world. And I must admit, um, the only thing that I knew about fundraising was what I, I, I had a vision of my dad. I remember it was the Six, the six Day War and they asked my dad to help to fund, raise money for Israel. And we always used to see my dad talking and people putting their hands in both pockets. The one pocket was to take out their tissue, their handkerchief. The other pocket was to take out their checkbook. And that's how I knew wow. how, that combination, because my dad died before I could ask him. Dad, what do we do? He would have known. He's been, you yeah. know, he's been, he was the vision. He was the, he was the inspiration. But he, he was a real expert. He used to, he, you know, raised the money for his institution in South Africa. And um, I didn't know how to do this. But I thought, I, I reckoned, okay, um, what, and I've learned over the years, I became a <laughs> fundraiser, I'd kind of, once I thought I was a social worker. And then yeah, I that's what happens. Director, I mean, then that's what happens to anyone who wants to do great you, things. You know, what, what, do you, what do you do? You have to raise the money. That's right. So I thought, well, I have to remember that this money isn't for me. That's the first thing. There are a couple of lessons I learned. I learned from my late dad that if you believe enough in something, then you can achieve it. And I learned from him that uh, you have to take risks and that you have to believe that you're going to, you're going to get there and um, that all battles that you believe in are worth fighting for. And you have to have patience, but you have to have determination. And those lessons, which he never really sat me down any day to tell me all those things, but I understood that those are the things that, his, uh, that he, he really taught me in his own way, in his own example. And I started to go and raise money, and I started to travel. To the States or to South Africa? Started off the first time, I w we, my brother went to South Africa because that was the first year and we reckoned that people would still want to donate in memory of my dad because right. he had been such a figure in the Johannesburg yeah. community. And that was true, that's how we set the, the cornerstone for the, for the fundraising. And then I went to New York and I, the Trumps would lift up the phone and say, Hi, my cousin's in here, you know, my cousin's here. Would you be prepared to see her? And these were business associates of these theirs? These were business associates of them. What, per, uh, what line of work were they in, real estate? They, or? they were in real estate and yeah. they, were, yeah, they had uh, various businesses. Where, and they're still in Florida? They're in, they, they started off in New York and then they moved to Florida. And then no. they, they had businesses in different parts. Where are they in Florida? They're they, in they, West Palm area? They, uh, they, they were in Aventura. Oh, nice. You know, and sure. now they're Sunny Isle. Uh, you know, Beautiful. You know, they, Young Israel they, Sunny they, Isles? They, you know, the Shul of Aventura? They used to, no, no, they went to Williams Island. They built Williams Island. Ah, they had okay. their own shul on Williams Island. Oh, my goodness, wow. Absolutely. That's where we, all the, the amazing events happened on Williams Island. Then they moved to, to Sunny Island. Uh, they, bought, they built a, a, a major, major project, Aquilina. And uh, they're very, very involved in the community. And yeah. they're the ones who really helped me to develop Beit Shapira. Shapiro. And I Incredible. used to travel. I used to hire a a, um, a video machine. I used to schlep it in a in a cab. We had a, d a, a, a what do you what do you a call VHS it? Or yeah, and I used to put it into their somebody's TV and you know Show them put it in the thing. Now, that's the way that I used to yeah. you know the old days of yeah. fundraising. You know how do you bring how do you bring the message? And slowly we developed an infrastructure of fundraising where um, we raised uh, fifty percent of our budget. We got the government to uh, to, to provide twenty five percent of the budget, and uh, the fundraising budget is a very very big responsibility of the ADZ Shapira because as you develop new services, and you you try state of the art programs, and you develop new models, you've got to fund them with. Uh, not with government funding. Government doesn't give funding for, for these kinds of uh, They want to uh, see a proven product. They, they, yeah, absolutely. So yeah. some, you know, as a non-profit, we always took the initiative and we, the model of 
answering the need first and then developing services, trying them out, researching them, teaching them and then handing them over to the government. And many laws were changed in Israel wow. as a result of these kinds of activities. The special ed law was one of the laws. Yeah, give an rated. example, please. Well, first I would say the most uh, critical example, I would say, is the early intervention, early intervention law. Um, when we started, there were education special ed services for children from the age of three. I think they were actually from the age of five. Then the special ed law came into existence, and then, but there were no services for children under the age of three. And we knew that the early years were the most critical years. And we, we worked on legislation together with Tamar Gushansky, who was a member of Knesset, and uh, they developed an early intervention uh, subcommittee of the, of the Knesset. And uh, they took Beit Izzy's model of early intervention. And, and that's um, across all services? And this is, it's across all, the early intervention for kids with, with, special, with special needs. And that today is a, a law that they passed the law of early intervention. Beit Izzy hired a, an attorney because we realized that legislation is critical Need to lobby. In, in order to be able to lobby and to help to bring about legislation. And um, we led a coalition of 50 nonprofits in Israel in the field of early intervention. Wow. And since then, many early intervention laws have taken place as a result of uh, you know, this lobby. What year was that? Oh, this is about, we started, I would say, about 15 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. Um, uh, I have to remember, I, I kind of think that life stands still, but <laughs> I've been out of my executive roles. I'm no longer the executive director, uh -huh. I'm the executive director. From 2006, I handed over to my deputy, amazing Jean Judas, uh, yes. you know, and uh, she became the executive director. Um, and I have to remember that the years have, have to be added on to, to <laughs> that. I can't pretend that, oh, maybe it, maybe it was 20 well, years ago. Well, it started 2006. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many years ago that was. Um, but, uh, you know, there are many, many exciting things that are happening for people with disabilities. We have Bed Izzy uh, developed the first inclusive university. We decided that people with different kinds of other disabilities or issues who would not normally be able to study at a general university have the right to, to higher education. And we developed a program together with the uh, School of Continuing Education at Barilan. And that became the first inclusive university. And there are courses throughout the country. Now people with disabilities are able, with intellectual and other disabilities, yeah. are able to learn on campuses. And they have modified programs. But they, you know, the nachas, the, the pride. I've been at these graduation ceremonies every year, and I look at these parents, and I look at these people, and they are confident. And they, one of them tells the story that they went to university and they were in the cafeteria, and a neighbor of his came up to him and said, what are you doing here? And he said, the same as you. Oh, and nice. that moment, you know, of pride that I can also be, and the neighbor knew him as a person with a disability. Right, uh, and, here a yeah. and here he is, uh, you know, studying. So, um, you know, there have been major changes in Israel. There's still a long way to go, uh, you know. What's still, what's still missing in the society? Well, um, firstly, I think that the issue, we, we, we've just had a big disappointment, I would say, in the special education. Uh, they just did, did what they call special education reform in Israel. We, we, we worked for years and years for inclusion, sure. where children who had mild developmental issues could be included, or even kids with more severe developmental issues could be included in regular schools with right. assistance, with sure. support uh, from uh, the Ministry of Education. And um, this was where kids, we had kids who went back into, you know, into the regular school system. Um, and the ministry would provide and all kinds of funding them, yeah. and everything. They changed the law now, despite uh, major protests and all sorts of uh, anger uh, from, from the parents. And they changed the law that parents <coughs> will have a choice. They think it's a good idea. Parents will have a choice between special ed and regular ed. If, you go, if you've got a child with a disability and he needs that special treatment and attention, and you don't want to give up on it, you need to put your child back into special ed. Mm -hmm. If you want your child to be in included in regular ed, then there's just only a certain amount of funding available for each school. And 
some schools could have one child and some schools could have 30 children with the same kind of packet uh, of, of hours or of treatment hours, etc. So it's in a way it's going back. So we, we've got to fight that in was some just, way. That was just a financial consideration uh, from the government? Well, or is there I, ideological I, I, I want to reasons? tell you, I can't understand it, I must say. I can't understand it. I think that there was a financial consideration, that they were putting a lot of extra money. Um, it was one of, the one of the considerations. I think some of them really believe that this is good. You know, they try and convince us that, 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 that it's good, that it's progress, but really it's, it's bringing us back. And, uh, you know, I, I felt rather disappointed. So what I'm just saying that these kinds of things still happen. They're things that, you know, there will still be areas where people with disabilities are not given uh, equal uh, employment in Israel. They, 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 there's not uh, equal opportunities for employment. People, there's not a minimum wage for people with disabilities. So we've still got a long way to go. You know, I think there's more awareness. I think that when there are protests, there are a lot more supporters. People understand that this is very close to home. I think kids are brought up much more now than they had in the past with a, an understanding that there are kids whom they could befriend or who, you know, who may be siblings of other friends and that they don't have to be afraid anymore. It, uh, there's a general change in the way people with disabilities are related to. On the other hand, I think we're really in a situation where um, there's still so much more to be done, you know, and uh, organisations such as Bait Easy, we're, we're very much today on the cutting edge. Bait Easy, for many years, for quite, quite a number of years, we, you saw us at APAC, which was a biggie for us. That was, my God, you know. <laughs> wow, Bait Easy, and I'm going, Dad, are you looking at this one? You know, 18,000, I think, you know, yes, one was. was supporting Jewish people, Ken, not only Jewish, you know. And there was a Trump there too, as well. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the <laughs> other Trump, my <laughs> <other> cousin. <laughs> uh, no, that, the, the one that you entered, there was a Trump? Uh, well, I think, that's, I think that's the I one that... Uh, Nikki, Nikki uh, but there was Spence. Uh, Spence oh, no, Spence, 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 Spence was there, Spence my pet, yeah. Spence. But uh, Nikki Haley was there, and she was very... That's right, she oh, brought down God. the house, yes. Yeah, amazing, amazing. Um, but uh, Bait Easy is also in the United Nations. We're consultants to um, ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, and Jean, our amazing executive director, is invited every year. This, this year she was on five different panels wow. and representing Israel in the field of disabilities. That's a real so Kiddush that, Hashem, that's you know. Be, yeah. be met. It's like I, when I think about you know, the dream of being in Zionist, let's make uh, Aliyah, and now carrying the flag of Medinat Israel, you know, even to the United Nations in a, an area which is there's consensus, you know, yeah. the consensus about, you know, disabilities. I mean, there may be issues of funding and da da, but the, the issue of um, Israel having state of the art, the top, you know, being amongst the leaders, the world leaders in the field of disabilities. Dayenu, you know, my, cup, my, my cup is overflowing. I'm, I, I, whoever would have thought? Yeah. In tech, in high tech, you know, we, we have accelerators getting young people who choose. To, uh, to develop new new methodology, new new technology for people with disabilities to yeah. improve the lives of people. A social so entrepreneurship, yeah. Total, well, it's, a total, it's a totally different world. You mentioned earlier that the the organization is affecting half a million people worldwide. Yes. Not, you know, in Israel it's 30,000, 30, 8,000 8, directly. More. And yeah, more. So yeah. how, how do you how quantify do, that do, impact well, internationally? Is that through this UN it's, work it's, or? Well, part of the UN, but I would also say through the legislation that we've helped to bring mm. about and um, our new, our new you know, the new technology. In other in countries that, though? In that, absolutely. Beit has also got an export. Uh, you, you spoke about export. Right, right. We have an international program, a, a global development, professional development program. We've uh, taught in China. We've taught in many South American countries. We've taught in America. We've had people coming here teaching to teachers. some of our teaching pro professionals. Yeah. We've helped to set up programs in different countries, some in South Africa, in various parts of the world. And that's with Israel know-how. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we get back to our pride of being in Israel and being Israelis. And Israel is advanced in so many fields, but how wonderful that it's also advanced in the field of disabilities, of providing the best possible services, you know, and solutions to people with disabilities. Yeah. And um, Beit Izzy has got a, a serious role in that. It's beautiful. And He's I'm watching like a suffer <laughs> with a lot of nightmares. Now you're the, you're the retiring <laughs> grandmother. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I noticed he's speaking about the international 
impact. I noticed on the walls all over, including in this office, <laughs> pictures of Bill Clinton. <laughs> and it looks like a 25th anniversary <laughs> event yeah. in 2005, which I, I believe is still when you were executive director, <laughs> since you said till 2006, uh, called the Silver Bowl. Tell me briefly about uh, that. That that was a real that was a real coup. I would say, you know, there've been moments. Watershed like, moments. Watershed moments. Yes. That was another watershed moment for Bait Easy. Uh, we were looking to celebrate the 25th anniversary of, uh, of Bed Easy, and uh, one of our donors, I spoke to one of our donors, a wonderful man, Henry Zeman, and I said to him, what do we do? There's got to be something. He said, you've got to have a big personality. <laughs> so I said, okay, how big? <laughs> so he said, very big. So I said, what, Clinton big? He said, Clinton big. I said, okay. And I went back, I thought, you know, he's crazy, I'm crazy, what am I talking about? And I phoned my cousin and I said, do you by any chance know the football? He said, yes, I do. He said, he's coming for Rabin's 10th, the 10th anniversary of the, of the assassination. Of the, yeah. So I said, wow. He's going to be in Israel anyway. Hey, he's going to be in Israel. Wow. Let's yeah. piggyback on that. And that's what we did. And how did you get him? Did you get through his people? His friend of Bill Clinton was a friend donors. of ours, donors and da 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 yeah. and it was all pulled together and, and you don't have to pay him or uh, a parent's fee I'm not saying anybody else in my uh, so I had slipped I had a couple had shekels had in his pocket you know a little bit of Yiddish a machsenisch wissendik you pretend that you're not hearing you don't know you know didn't cost us anything <laughs> except we, we created this this was the Binyan Ayamuma we created uh, this amazing event but we you made a gala out of it a, 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 amazing gala he came to our gala and uh, he was fantastic. Oh, he's a wonderful speaker. He's a wonderful Whatever speaker. Whatever you think about his politics, he's a wonderful um, speaker. Not getting into anything yeah. else. He was a wonderful speaker, and he was, because he was the ex-president, the right. brief, he was, you still call him president, sure. you know, and he came, and he, the turning point for Bait Easy was amongst the business community. Mm. If Bait Easy could bring a Bill Clinton to an event, then there must be something behind the Real gravitas, yeah. That's it. And that was uh, firstly, uh, uh, there was only a select number of people. They had to pay a select amount of money. They, those it was a high ticket item, and you really and we, we really you maximized it, it uh, you know. And he, when he stood on the stage, uh, you know, and it, they briefed him in the middle of the night before. And um, I, what I did, I, I made my presentation. I said, you know, when you're in, during your tenure, this law was passed and this law was passed. And he got on the stage and he said, you know, at, for 20 minutes he spoke and he spoke about disabilities and he spoke about his experiences with people who have disabilities and he said when you leave here look in the mirror and say to yourself is there anything else that I could have done today to improve the life of somebody with a disability wow. what can I tell you you know if you ever hear some that was a moment you know and I think um, you know, there are those moments, there were those Beshert moments of Be for, for, for Bed Izzy Shapiro. I think that the whole Bed Izzy story has got to do with a lot of Beshert, a lot of it was meant to be. You have to be able to move it in the right direction. You have to, you spoke about social entrepreneurship. Bed Izzy actually turned out to be a social entrepreneur organization without me knowing about Decades it. Decades before that was a buzzword. That, yeah. That, yeah. But without me knowing about it. It, it, it turned out to be really because social entrepreneurship is you identify a disenfranchised population and you come up with a solution uh, to, to be able to support and, and to answer the, the needs and then you institutionalize, you bring, this, uh, bring that over and make it part of the government policy. And in a way, that's what made easy. We, we developed we recognized the community and their needs and we developed solutions to the problems and we you know gave it over to government and we also scaled up we are very very involved today in looking at the services and how we can scale them up so that other places can pick them up and 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 take them and run with them and governments can t you know make changes and, and 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 facilitate change and that's got to do with my dad's vision of change in Israel, you know, that, and he, my God, he, he just wanted people with disabilities to be accepted with, you know, the opportunities, but that's, that was just a kind of a, an underlying thing. He gave the inspiration for so much of, of for everything actually, of what has happened in the messages in the, you know, that he gave, that's the message that we took and we just, you know, we multiplied it. Well, wow. and it's um, 
It's a joy every day. It's a joy. I'm sitting in this office and you can see this building was had been through many alterations, about to have another one. But when they moved me <coughs> from up from downstairs upstairs, I said on one condition that I'll be able to see the kids coming to school every day. So they made me a window. <laughs> they made you a window. Like, okay, the vantage point, you know, everything has got to be planned properly. Right. Even the way the right. book. Because that's where the inspiration is. Sure. You know, sure. The, the children. Well, it's, it's very clear that you're inspired and uh, that's the only way things work. And uh, it sounds like it's clearly an inspiration from above, from, from your father's influence. And as you say, Bashir, I feel a sense of Bashir having the privilege to just to sit in this office and learn about this amazing organization that I only stumbled across <laughs> because I was at an APAC uh, conference. Yeah. And uh, really, I wish you incredible success, Atlachan, continuing to drive this enterprise forward uh, and changing the, the landscape for children with disabilities and really changing the world in the process. So, Naomi Stuchiner, thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews You Should Know.